Hello everyone and welcome to Shelved. We have a special episode today. Oh, well, it's not that special. It's just another episode, but it's a fun one. It's a script that is super interesting. If you listen to our mini episode, you know what I'm talking about. So today we are going to be talking about The Crow 2037. And this is a script written by Rob Zombie. Now, I am I have not seen all of Rob Zombie's movies, but what I have seen, I am a fan of his work. Um I am actually a big fan of his first Halloween remake. I, I didn't see the second one because of all the negativity it got. But um, I, I love his just brutal, dark, grimy filmmaking techniques. Like, he just makes everything feel so intense. And just he has a look and tone to his movies that I genuinely love. And you just don't really get a lot of movies like that nowadays. Like, maybe if you look more towards, like, the Blumhouse production movies. Like, maybe, like, The Purge would be kind of a similar feel to what I picture Rob Zombie movies. But this movie, it's so hard to dissect because it's just so weird and interesting. And I really enjoyed talking about this with my guest Vinny, who he was on to talk about Resident Evil. Um, He's a huge horror fan. So kind of any of the horror scripts I come across, they usually go to him and we, we talk about horror a lot. And he's a big Rob Zombie fan as well. He loves all the Rob Zombie movies. So he was the perfect guest to get for this one. And we were both super into the script, as you'll hear. I mean, we have some caveats, but uh, it was really fun to talk about. It's a really interesting movie. We're both huge fans of The Crow to varying degrees. And for a long time, it was one of my favorite movies, and it is one of his favorite movies. And um, it was just kind of one of those movies I stumbled upon as when I was young and hearing the story of Brandon Lee and everything. But I was I was really drawn to that movie. I still really love it. I love the comic book, and I've even to a certain degree enjoy some of the bad terrible crow sequels that they made um but yeah this is this is a really interesting episode it's a really interesting script i highly recommend checking it out we try to cover everything in there but there's so much to discuss it's worth reading on your own but i really hope you enjoy the episode it's 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 a fun one (laughs) Um, i'm kind of stumbled over my words just trying to describe it but I don't think I should describe it. The episode should do that for yourself. You don't need that in the intro. So um, thanks, everyone, who's been listening to the show. And I hope you're following the mini episodes because there's some fun stuff coming up on there. Um, but yeah, so here's our discussion of The Crow 2037 written by Rob Zombie. You ready? Yep. All right. Oh, let's talk about this this script. Um, as soon as I found out that this one existed, mm-hmm. you were the first person. I think even before I gave you the Resident Evil one, I was like, well, obviously, I have to give this to Vinny. Because you, you know more about Rob Zombie than I do. I haven't seen all of his movies. But yeah, I, we, and I'm we, also like... I. The Crow is like uh, I've seen that over probably a fucking hundred yeah, times. Yeah, it's in my life. it's like one of my favorite movies. It's always been the top of one of my That's favorite movies too. Like that was a movie I discovered at my dad's house. Like my dad's house is where I discovered a lot of random movies because something happened where he had a roommate or something at one point who had like a bunch of movies that just kind of aggregated into my dad's collection, and that roommate moved and never took his movies. And The Crow was one of them. So the first time I saw it was just. I'm at my dad's house looking for something to watch, and I stumbled upon this movie and threw it into the VCR, and it became one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, kind of like kind of like kid, Aliens. Like I, um, I actually went to the movie opening night with the, really. So you saw it in theater? Yeah, at the old Logan Theater when it was really run down and shitty. And I went with my uncle and my uh, mom's boyfriend at the time, and my uncle was really excited about it. I know he was hyping it up, which kind yeah. of got me excited because I was always super close with him, and um. Let's go see it opening night, and it just it just left like a huge lasting impression, you know. And then did, on top did of that, you or your uncle know the comic or know that it was based on a comic? Uh, no, no. I yeah. was. I mean, at that time, I was I was pretty young. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I didn't know for a really long time that it was. And have you read it since? Um, no. Really? I, haven't. I have it. I should bring it in for you. It's it's similar but different. Um, kind of like this script. <laughs> yeah, it's very different from this script. Yeah. Um, what I'll say about the the original movie and 
I'll even say it a little bit about the first sequel, City of Angels, in the book that I think is lost in this script is a lot of the dialogue I would say is poetic. Like the book is very poetic. Like it's all of, it's a lot of him rambling kind of like if you take the scenes in the movie where he's rambling to people, like where he's quoting the Raven and stuff like that. And just all of his dialogue in the book is very similar to that. He's never like outright talking to these people. He's just kind of like reading a poem to them is the only way I can think of to describe it. Yeah. But I feel like, Eric Draven in the movie, he was very um, tasteful. Like, and yeah. what he did, like, he, just the way it was all put together, um, you know, like, the victims, aren't we all? Yeah. Everything just had, like, that certain line, you know, like, there's Brandon just, Lee had a charisma that he really brought to the character. Yeah, which is why, I mean, I've always kind of been one of those people who, I mean, I don't ever want to see the movie be remade as much as I hear talks about it. And yeah. It's, it's just because, like, for one, the guy died during the filming, yeah. you know? And when I was reading on the passing of Brandon Lee, it was pretty sad, you know? And as a kid, it was even more kind of traumatic, you know? Because yeah. you watched the movie and just to see... I, I used to have the VHS, too. Yeah. At the end of the VHS, they had the last, um, last ever... Yeah, his, his interview. Interview. Which I, I didn't have that version of the VHS. So I came to it after that had happened. So I didn't... I wasn't really ingrained. Like, to me, it was like, oh, you know, it really sucks that this happened to this dude because he's really good in this movie and now he's not going to be able to do anything mm-hmm. else. But, um... Like, some other people in my life I knew, like, they had that last interview version. That wasn't the version I have, so I haven't even seen that. Yeah, it was cool. He would always talk. He would basically talk about, like, you know, what books he would read and, and yeah. like the authors he liked. And just, like, That's got to be on YouTube. Random. I should look that up. I just remember watching that and just the reality of death, like, kind of hit me at a young age, you know, where I would watch that. And just yeah. Bummed me out because you watch it, and I'm not just saying it because, you know, he's Bruce Lee's son or whatever. Like, he was the crow. He yeah. was Eric Draven. Kind of like the way people say Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man. Like right, Brandon or, Lee embodied the character and was a perfect interpretation. Or Tim Curry was Pennywise. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's a, and the Robert England is Freddy Krueger. Yeah. There's some things that, I mean, granted, like Robert England was in like fucking what is it, like seven or eight Nightmare on Elm Streets? You know, yeah. Compared to the to Brandon Lee, but yeah, I mean, you know, his performance in one movie was that powerful. Yeah, and. Going into reading the script, like I was, I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't sure if it was yeah. gonna be like his spinoff on Eric. Trayden's I mean, from story. from the title alone, it kind of messes with your expectations because you're like, already this is, like you know, it's a crow in the future. You don't know what kind of future, mm-hmm. which is probably not the one you might expect from the title. But um, yeah, it's really like knowing kind of like a fantasy movie. Yeah, and that that's definitely what it feels like, and. Knowing, like, oh, Rob Zombie wrote a Crow movie is just... That's, Intriguing. Yeah. And it's not something in your brain... And, and as far as I can tell, this might be the first movie he ever wrote before, like... Hall- I mean... Uh, well, yeah, like, I mean, he's... Jack's all that shit. Yeah. Halloween. Before his, like, Hollywood career. Right. Which, so I've, I've seen the Halloween <laughs> movies, and I have not seen basically all of his other movies. So you've seen them all. Yeah. But... I've seen bits and pieces of like Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses, so I, I see his tone, yeah, like or like he- his creative essence in those movies. In reading this script, I see a lot of that here as well, just the way things are described and stuff yeah. like that. But I feel like this one, it definitely from even from all his movies, this this script definitely steps out of the box for him. It's like really out yeah. there, you know. Yeah. Um, this was something I said to you the other day is I feel like this script is what I feel like everybody who loves Rob Zombie's music is like the movie they would have loved for him to make where it's like demons in hell and fighting them and like shit like that. So let's talk about how it starts. Yeah. Um, Cause right from the beginning is where I felt like, Oh, right away. This feels like a Rob Zombie movie. Yeah. And I wasn't sure. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't know if he was going to approach it in the same way that it was approached in the first one. If it was Eric yeah. Draven, if it was, you know, they kill his fiance, or if it was that same story. And yeah, like, is this going to be a reboot? Different. Is it going to be a sequel? And it, it's basically a standalone thing. Yeah, and, you know, I was okay with it. It starts where... Um, Damien they, Finch is right. the is the villain. Right. And it starts with him and a witch. Gretchen. Yeah, which we don't learn a lot about the witches throughout yeah. the movie. She vanishes and, in the beginning, and then... No, yeah, she comes, she comes, she comes back at the end. end. And this is... I'll just say this is my biggest problem with the script. There's a there's a lot going on. So you there's a lot of characters. There's a lot 
of things being explained in the world, but I just don't feel like we get enough explanation on everything. Right. Like, there's a lot of things just kind of, like, brush aside that I'd like to learn more about. Yeah. And the and, witches are one of them. Okay, so we're, we'll get we'll get to, I guess, a little more detail as to what I'm about to talk about, but my biggest problem with the script is, for one, the main character, who I guess you would say would play the Eric Draven's character... Who is um, his name is Basil. Basil. Yeah. Um he he seemed like a really cool character, but for one, I didn't like the fact that he came back with no remembrance of what had happened. Yeah, so it, it almost it's a real interesting like, way to take it. Like the revenge aspect of it kind of it's the way I view it is like in the original Crow, right? If Brandon Lee would have came back and not known what the fuck had happened, it's like, yeah. okay, so then what? But he came back with a mission, and it yes. almost made it that more meaningful. You know, like you... Yeah, it like... It was like he, a hit list. He, he knew what he wanted to do, and he had a plan. Yeah, like when he comes back, and I'm trying to think in the book, I think it's it's kind of similar. Like, he knows what's going on and everything. But it's, yeah, so he comes back in the in the first movie, and he wanders in the apartment, and he's, and he's getting flashbacks. It's like the crow brings him to the room, and then once he goes in their old apartment, that's when he starts flashing back on everything, and that's basically when his mission starts. Yeah, and on top of that, I didn't... There's so many characters that are so... I would say there's too many characters. Um, It's, it's not really that for me. It's the... Damien, who can turn into a stone golem, and yeah, you know, there's stuff just like that not enough like, explanation on his power. It just takes away from the characteristics of the crow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when it all comes down to it's it, very different. The reason why the crow stuck out is because there was nobody else like him. When you yeah. see Brandon Lee go through, they look at him like, "What the fuck is this guy?" Yeah. You know. And then you see this 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 um, script, and it's like everybody has power, so he's just some Joe Schmo. Yeah. You know what I mean? And well, let's 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 start from the beginning. So the beginning. You get Damien talking to this witch about he wants to rule the world. We have no idea why, just because he can, I guess. And there, she's like, yeah, there's. I see a vision of the future, and this person is going to stop you. So his whole idea is like, well, let's just go stop them now. But so it, was, then, it was a boy. Yeah. So he, was, he didn't understand us how some little boy can do it. Yeah. So we then we cut to the boy's house, and he's hanging out with his mom, and we hear about his dad, who never really becomes a character. We never see or hear anything about his dad ever again. And it's implied that he's just like on his way home from work. But before that happens, Damien kills his mom and then child death right away shoots the kid in the head. Yeah. And then we cut to, I don't know if they what? say exactly how many years later. 27 years later. Yeah, 27 years later. So now we're in 2037. And Basil's just a character. He's he's an adult. Um, I'm very confused That's on... why he has a fucking sidekick? <laughs> I mean, I, that, that it's like, I think they explain he found him wandering in the graveyard. Yeah, but I, it's just, again, you're, it's, I felt like it was kind of taken away from the main character. Like, it was. And honestly, more? Basil doesn't have very much dialogue. Like, so his, he has a buddy fat. So we cut to the future and like we get a montage basically of everything that's gone horrible. Like Damien somehow takes over the world and is like in league with Satan or something. Yeah. Like all of a sudden the world is now a hellish desert landscape and he rules everything and there's like monsters and demons. And I mean the script, the tagline is a new world of gods and monsters, which is literal dialogue taken from the movie at like multiple different parts. Yeah. Cause I mean, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was during he was watching Uncle Wolfie's uh yeah. midnight special and Was that a real thing? No. It okay. was just things it was, it was kinda of like a Sven Gulli type thing. And um I guess during like that scene he said he mentioned that the whole gods and monsters and stuff. Yeah, so that's, and then he says it again at the end, like when they're doing battle. And it kinda of triggers a whole bunch of memories and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it was um the reason why I liked the beginning is because it was really ruthless. And I thought yeah. it was going to be a really good setup for Basil's character. I thought yeah. I came into it not thinking there was going to be a sidekick, not thinking there was going to be a And I gotta say, this others. is like the third script I've done that begins with child death. Oh, so like, you have yeah. like a weird fetish? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not the one picking them. You guys are the ones who pick the scripts. Um, oh, fuck me. Um, okay, so after that, 27 years later, he comes back. Um, well, it's not even that he comes back. We just cut to him as an adult. Like, we don't learn about him coming back until halfway through the movie. Like, we cut to him and Fats, who's his buddy, 
and they're like bounty hunters in this crazy yeah, world, and they're horse. they're yeah they're hunting bounty. It's basically like an it's like, a western it's like in the, the west future. world. Yeah, yeah, it's like a western in the future. It's like very west world esque. And that's 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 another thing that kind of weirded me out because like there was no explanation as to why it was kind of yeah. went back in time. In Again, he creates a really interesting world, but just doesn't tell us enough about it. Right, like and he tells us a lot about some things, but then there's more. It's like I'd really like to know how the world got from what it was to what it is now. Put it this way: Rob Zombie's movies sometimes are hard to understand after watching them more than once. And I'm telling you from experience. <laughs> So to fucking read this and not have any kind of visual, you know, yeah. I mean, th- don't get me wrong. He does. He does um, a pretty good job of painting a picture. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I mean, with the kind of graphic visuals and ideas that he has in his head, yeah. it never, you can never really picture things until Rob Zombie does it. Cause he has such a yeah, weird, I mean, unique say what, way of looking at things. Say what you will about Rob Zombie's movies. Some have been successful. Some haven't. I fall on the side of really liking his style and tone. I think he's a hardcore filmmaker and, I, I don't think there's a lot of people making movies like he does, but he he's a really good writer and he he can he can paint you a word picture and you really see the world he envisioned. It's just like in the writing, I want a little more history, right? Like and, ghouls, like where did the ghouls come from? Yeah, you know, like I understood that they they thought they were dead and all of a sudden they flashed yeah. light. Yeah, dirt. it's kind of like Lost Boys scene. Yeah, you know, and but, I'm, um, I'm totally fine with keeping some things vague, but there's some things like like the the world in particular, like how it's changed, why it's changed, why he did what he did and stuff like this. I wish there was a little more of that. Like there's a lot of implications of like, okay, we have these characters like Skag, I think is his name is, yeah. who's like his general guy. Like, okay, you kind of get the Skag hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, Captain Skag, I think. Cuz it just reminded me of Borderlands cuz there's characters called Skags in there. Me of uh, Captain Spaulding. That's why <laughs> I was like No, but um I there were, there were a couple characters like Skag seems like a really cool character. Yeah. It's kind of ruthless. Another guy kind of like um the boss's go-to guy when he needs somebody to yeah take and care of somebody. Yeah, they're kind of introducing characters left and right in the beginning. Like we get introduced to this like governor or mayor or something of like it seems like the earth is divided into different territories and those territories have governors. And then right away we see one's wife getting executed and him being arrested for treason. We never learn why. Like the character shows up later at the end for very little effect. And yeah, it's just like. There's no real point to even have that character in there because he doesn't contribute to the story in the end. No. Um, it's, I guess it's just basically to show the ruthlessness of Skag, who does come off as kind of like an evil dick and like you're waiting for him to get his. And I, I like where that ends up with him and the guy he's fighting against, which I just realized <laughs> I took very little notes on character names. No, I had a couple too and I forgot. Um, so um, like... Yeah, so I mean, the beginning is a lot of just like bounty hunting. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But like, uh, okay. So another thing is, I wish he would have kept the original style of the whole revenge. Yeah. It, okay, let me, I'm trying to think of a way to word it. Okay, so in the original, right? Brandley obviously he wanted to go off the top hat. Yeah. But um. Well, actually, in reality, he's going after T-Bird's crew. He doesn't even right. know he has to well, go after Top Hat. Until what I'm saying he... is that that's, the, that's, the, that's your big boss. That's your fucking, yeah. you know, Goro or whatever from yeah. Mortal Kombat, you know? But you're, you're going um, after T-Bird. You're going after all these people, you know? And, yeah. and But all of them kind of had a role in what he was going after. Yeah, absolutely. And what was weird is, like, these new characters that they're introducing had... It's like, okay, so what do they have to do with the death? Nothing. You know I mean? Like, nothing. Literally, like, Damien is going, the only one. Damien and, and Gretchen. And he, like, to think that Basil That's something came I back from the about. dead to just make money. Like, what is... What pisses yeah. me off? Like, what is a dead guy... What is he going to profit with real money? Like, and it, see, it the thing away. is, he doesn't even know he's dead, does he? He does, because he does... He says it in the end. Like, he, he tells... Yeah, but he, tells, he finds um, out... Because he... So, yeah, I mean, he comes back, he has no memory. That's the thing. He doesn't know that he's dead and then once he gets eaten by a monster and his memories come back that's when he finds out that he is and that's when he he shows fats and he, i think he stabbed himself in the hand or something i don't know i just feel like i to it's, me it's hard got... for me to put like all like to put the full picture together because I, I just had so many questions yeah. and i wish it's the kind of thing where i mean it's it's unrealistic but i fucking wish a guy like rob zombie was next to me to be like okay well yeah and I, I don't know how many drafts of this he done. He did. Maybe this is his first and only draft, and there could have been more revisions. That information, there's not a ton of information out there on this movie, other than 
he turned this in and I don't even know who he turned it into. I don't know who owns the rights to that franchise at the time or if it's the same people. Um, and they, they passed on it, but they kept the script cause they feel like there's a good movie in here. And I agree with them. I 100% agree with this, that there's a good movie in here and that they could just rip out all the parts to the crow and make it its own movie. And I 100% no, would absolutely. like to would it's, like it's, to see that it sticks out. Like the characters sound really cool, but it's just like yeah, like you can uh, keep all the names and right. Keep and, the, everything. and the thing is like it's just hard for me because I love the crow. I mean, I watch the movie and I feel like I fucking yeah. quote it from beginning to end. Yeah, but then like you know, so I feel like I'm a little more harsh on the movie. But if I were to read it with no with no knowledge at all of yeah. that it has to do with the crow. I mean, there's I'm very sure. little reference to the bird itself anyway. Yeah. Like. And, and I mean, another weird thing was, um, Damien, when they would go through that weird alien world and things would turn. Yeah. Black and white. That was real weird. And it's just like, I, was that, al- did they specifically call it out as aliens or was it like demons? It was like, it was like, or did they just they define it was like a, an alien type? But I forgot it was. Yeah, like a so harm. yeah, we get this like alien creature introduced that again can not enough information on it doesn't really contribute to the plot other than he says that he can kill Basil. Yeah, and then that he doesn't. Basically, <laughs> the the alien is what foresees the future and tells him. Like, yeah, you know, this is what's going to happen, and there's going to be. A and he, ha- I, stops it's you. implied that he, a lot of Damien's power comes from this thing. Right. So, um, um, I mean, another cool thing was. I'm glad that they at least kept the parts where you can still see from the crow's point of view. Yeah. You know, and he would still get instincts because through the bird. Yeah. Know? Which is something some of the movies are more vague on than others. But yeah, you always, you always get the idea that he at least gets some power and stuff from the crow. Right. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a while before the crow even really plays a part because it's, yeah, like the first half of the movie is just them bounty hunting. Like mm-hmm. they catch a bunch of people, they get a bunch of money and then they hear about some fighting pits or whatever. And they go there and then Basil's fighting some monster, which, yep. you know, he describes as some giant eight foot tall monster with a huge mouth or whatever, and ends up eating him. And then inside the monster's like stomach is where he finds out who he is. Yeah, this and is where they set they set him up, right? Mr. Moorhead or something? Dr. Dr. Moorhead. Moorhead, yeah. And so he's been like watching him for like a little while. Yeah, and, and I guess what well, it was Skaggs who had uh I believe it was Skaggs who was hiding in the room when yeah. Dr. Moorhead told Basil in so fact, to, about the, the pit fighting. Yeah, so Gretchen informs Damien that Basil's alive and around, and so yeah, they, they find they, a way to tr- to get them to go to a place, kind of trap them. Yeah, and then he gets eaten by the monster, and Skag's like, "Ha ha!" You know, we took care of him, and then he gets all of his memories about the crow, and he bursts out of the monster, and now all of a sudden he knows what he has to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, vaguely. And, and like Brandon Lee, it's cool. Uh, he he does heal like. They said that in yeah, which comes into play very little, honestly. Yeah, like the 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 walls of the stomach and all that. They said that yeah, like the his acid would was burn. burning him, and then, yeah, but he would come out and his he would heal yeah. So like you get that, you get a scene way. where he sticks his hand on a knife, and then you get a couple scenes where he gets shot, and that's really the only time they really touch on that. Which I think that was something handled way better in the Brandon Lee movie. Like one of my favorite scenes of that movie yeah, when he is him? with Fun Boy yeah. when he puts his hand up against the gun and he's like, "Take your shot" or whatever. Like such a good moment, and they do. You know that whole scene where he keeps shooting them and stuff. And he spits and I, out the bullet. No, that, yeah. that was kind of cool. Yeah, that that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I just wish there was more of that. There's not a lot of crow like moments in here, which I mean, you could argue that he's doing something a little more original. And then another thing that I was confused at, um, confused about is uh, I'm assuming this crow didn't have the makeup because they said they, they said okay, uh, I was going to ask end, you about only that. Only the end when when. He had memories. And, there was something and he like said he started crying, crying blood, blood and that blood resembled the, the crow. Yeah, so but wasn't he, there a scene early in it was when the, he was when a he, kid? Is when he because he had the makeup from when he was from oh, the Halloween. Yeah. And I guess um, he put his so hand when, over his face. I, yeah, I thought there was a part where they talk about lightning flashing and you seeing the the makeup on his face, but that must be when he comes back. Yeah, no, because they I, I think they put either he puts his hand over Basil's face as a little kid, or yeah. they cover his mouth or whatever. And it kind of messes up the makeup, and that's what he said. The okay. Crow like. Yeah, because yeah, there's there's really no indication that he looks like that the whole movie. No, because I mean, there's you would think in, in a western style environment, like um, who was it that Fango 
Dango. Fango Dango. Yeah, yeah, I literally have like, a note that just says this character's name is Fango Dango. Yeah, so he's talking to Fat. Like they're at the bar and they're looking over at at Basil from a distance, and he's talking to him, and he's just like, "Who's this guy?" You know, like, "Yeah, who the hell does this guy think he is?" And you know, Fat's just like, "Well, he's he's pretty much a badass." You yeah, know? and they do a good job of making him a badass. Right, like, right. But you would think if he was wearing makeup, wouldn't he be like, "Who's that clown over there?" So yeah. I the whole time I just got this vibe that he just was a normal looking dude, which kind yeah. of I'm not. But I mean, in the world he describes, it wouldn't be that out of place for some guy to be walking around with some black lines painted on his face either. For sure. But I, I mean, we're like in a world would, where would, fucking demons are around. I don't think anybody's going to really care. Uh, but I feel like it should at least be brought up. Considering, yeah. considering it should be style, highlighted in the text at some point. Yeah, considering they repeated a couple other things, you know, the guys yeah. and monsters, they beat it to the ground. But oh yeah. Yeah, those just just little things I, I I'm trying to figure out. I guess we'll never really know, but yeah. Um, so after he remembers who he is, we get the scene with him and Fats in like a bar, and he's like convincing him, like, "Hey, you know, like I I remember now." And Fats kind of doesn't believe him. And that's when he sticks his hand on the knife to show him or whatever. And then at some point they get separate. I think Basil goes outside to basically like get some fresh air type situation, and Fats is just. They got a lot of money at this point, so he's just enjoying himself in the bar, and then he ends up being led to a room where he eventually gets kidnapped by Skag. Yeah. And they bring him to Damien's castle, and the whole thing is they're trying to lure Basil to them. Right. And this is where we meet crazy Dr. Moorhead. Yeah. And do you remember the names of the girl and the other guy? Dude, I didn't even know how to pronounce one of them. Yeah, the girl has some really hard to pronounce name. Yeah, there's some And these are the names I forgot to take notes on. Um... And that's really pissing me off because they're kind of important characters. Okay, we're gonna do this right now. We're gonna fucking do this. I'm gonna look it up. Yeah, because I don't have I don't have the script on this thing anymore. Um, but yeah, so we get Doctor Moorhead. And he's got two buddies. One who used to work for Damien. He used to work for Skag as like one of his soldiers, basically. And he's he's gone. He left them. I think he was like left for dead, basically. And he uh, has joined Dr. Moorhead, and they're kind of like a traveling circus situation. And then they have a girl who's like a knife thrower who has a really weird name. That, that's She's the name I couldn't pronounce. Tarkus? Tarkus, Tarkus Thorn? Yeah, I think it was Tarkus. And then there's um, Casimorden, which is that alien that we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, so that's the crazy alien that gives Damien his powers. Yeah. And then um, there's Tarkus. The girl's name starts with an I. That's all I remember. There was a uh, Doctor Hives, which was the he's like the crazy doctor that Damien. So Damien has like a basically like a Doctor Kevorkian fucking dude who's or Doctor Frankenstein guy who creates monsters. But the girl seems like is is Raphael or something. Yeah, like is Raphael like, or is uh, yes? Yeah, so, so weird. Um, we can just call her is Raphael. It doesn't really fucking yeah, matter. It doesn't even matter. But um, I mean, she's she's described as like a fourteen year old, and Basil doesn't want her coming with until she like proves that she can throw knives really good. Yeah, so this pretty much ends up being um, once he meets them, that kind of ends up being it becomes his crew. really straightforward. Yeah, like yeah, and it becomes like I really this is where I'm torn on this movie. I really like the world they set up. I really like the characters. I think like the and he's really good at like separating the characters in the dialogue. Like Doctor Moorhead has this really weird way of talking because you just imply he's a fucking weird dude in the head, and he he feels like a cool character. And um, Tarkus, that the other guy. Um, you, you get enough history between him and Skag who they come head to head once they, yeah. you know, f- get to the final battle and everything. And I really like the characters. I really like the story. It's just the parts that are the crow or what weigh this script down. Yeah. I, I almost, I, like, I think I you take feel, out the intro. Like, I don't feel like Basil was the main. He doesn't focus. feel like the main character. No. Fats feels like the main character to me. Like yeah. he's the one who gets more dialogue. He's the one who seems to know what's going on. He's the main focus at the end of the, at the end of the fucking movie. Yeah, like, and even though okay. even though Basil's the badass, and it kind of seems like Fats is the brains, and he knows that he can keep this Basil guy around to protect him, and they work well together. And so Fats is like kidnapped and held at Damien's castle, and that's basically just there to lure basil there and so he they walk there with their crew and they're basically just mowing things down along yep. the way they sneak in split up two two and they go and there's pretty much clean a house and you hear yeah. about the that monster ape type you know monster 
that um yeah um the one that dr hives has they they like right so they have to like go through like some marshes where they fight basically like zombies it sounds like um but i picture more zombies from like army of darkness not like just like resident evil style zombies um and then they um crawl up through like the body dumping tubes into the castle where they dump all the bodies and from the castle into the marsh yeah yeah, and then that's where we come across Dr. Hives, yeah. who he's got the... Yeah, they basically just describe it as like a giant gorilla monster who... They just kind of take care of it right yeah, away. They never, uh, they never really even explain how he was made or if he was a human that no. they experimented with. It was just kind of just... It's just like... like they, they kind of appear at Dr. Hives and he's just like, open the cage, and they let the monster out. And like, I don't even remember what happens to it. Does um, um, I think... They, doesn't he stab him? I forgot. But was it, it was it um, Tarkus, whatever? Uh, yeah, Tarkus is the one who because he's he's impo- he's implied to be like a bigger guy. I think he charged. They both charged at each other, and he yeah, stabbed, but he also got hurt as well. Yeah, but yeah, I think he just kills it immediately. And it was like the, it seemed like a big threat. Yeah, there's know, there's immediate, very little danger. Killed. And it definitely shows that this is an early script for Rob Zombie because it does kind of follow a traditional format, and it's. Um, it's pretty simple. Like I said, it becomes really straightforward once he remembers who he is. Because, yeah, it's literally just like now they have their path and they just they do it with very little obstacle. And you kind of get your moment at the end where everybody's engaged in different battles. So, like, they get into the castle and Basil is heading for Damien and Tarkus is fighting Skag. And then, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Moore, Moorhead and the, is, is Raphael or whatever her name is. They go after the witches, right. and everybody's kind of in their battle, and it all has the starting point where, hey, they're all kicking ass. Like they kill a bunch of witches. He's beating Skag's ass, and Basil is sneaking going up after on Damien, going after Damien, and then it all kind of goes into, oh, now they're all in trouble. Like yeah. Skag's winning, and the witches, uh, Gretchen, the the main witch, is still alive, and she locks them in a cage. Then Damien and somehow turns into a fucking. Damien turns into a giant yeah, stone golem stone for golem. I don't, reasons. <laughs> I don't. I didn't understand that at all. Um, but you know what? I will say the the battle between Basil and Damien. Sound it, it was kind of fun. You know that but, part. I started like. Maybe I was just getting kind of burned out on reading it at that point because, like, the end to me gets a little fuzzy. Um, the, the okay, so after he, um, pretty much it's it's in pretty similar fashion of the original where you know they're at the rooftop and he yeah. kind of gains the, the memory that kind of gives him that well, last the, boost. I you think know? the alien tries to attack him and it has it's implied yeah, it has the, like I squid like arms end, or the, something. The end of a the end of it is like a... I remember him gra- being grabbed by like squid world. arms. Yeah, yeah he yeah. he pulls him in the alien world because the alien's trying to kill him. Which with that that's that's kind of where I got you know. I yeah, felt like, like that part didn't really need to happen. You know, no, that whole storyline and character really should it doesn't fit this script at all. Let me like, say if you're if you're hearing this and you're confused as shit as to what the hell we're talking about this <laughs> yeah. alien world, I guarantee you you're gonna be just as confused if you try to read the script. Yeah, so, it, it does not make any really sense. Fucking trying. Yeah. But, and, like, the more we talk about it, the more I'm like, did I like this script? Because, like, there's a lot of weird shit here. No, because, I mean, you I mean, you nailed it when you said, like, if they were to make this movie and it had nothing to do with The Crow, yeah. I would be so on board. You yeah, know? I'm but, like, take out the beginning. Take out the whole him killing him and, like, just drop us in this world. Yeah, I mean, I guess you, I, can, I can see where you sprinkle a little bit of The Crow where Fats almost ended up being, like, the Sarah where yeah. he was trying to save her but in the end, you know what I mean? And then, they don't. Um, like his mom was killed and we get very little reference to like, he's not avenging just himself. He's avenging kind of glad that I, I did like the evil dead thing in the end where the mom came. Yeah. Back. So they bring her back for like, and it's literally like two seconds. Yeah. It's like half a paragraph on a page of just like, you're not my mom. And then it's, well, kind of, it was like, what's going on? You know, like uh, yeah. for, for a second there, you can see a little vulnerability from Basil. You yeah. Know, like, which for like wasn't shown at all half throughout seconds. The, and then yeah, it's which just, was kind of cool. Cause I felt like throughout the whole, Thing he didn't show a lot of emotion, didn't show a lot. I mean, here and there, yeah. Like when he would even grin, they made note of it. So that's yeah. how you knew how how little emotion this guy showed. Yeah, I mean, they basically just imply, yeah, this dude's a stone cold badass. Yeah, and so yeah, that's kind of the only time you get a little, any of the emotion at yeah. the end. And then as soon as he he finally fights back, gets you know right before he's about to die, he ends up you know his his eyes again, he cries tears of blood. You yeah, know, I have to think about the whole death of his mom and everything, and um fights back kills damien and at that point all the other characters who are in trouble 
all the monsters and witches in it, and, and, and everything zombies, just, just like turns to disappears. Dust. Yeah. yeah, that and, um, I thought was kind of lame. You know, and they, they, they the, see Basil. It's the end all. Like, oh, if you kill the main bad guy, then it's all good, and everything just goes away. I was a little, I was a little disappointed with that. Um, and then you know they go and the characters obviously at that point they realize what had happened. And Basil yeah. won. Yeah. You know he he did it, and you know they all meet they all see each other and he's asking, "Where's Fat? You know, yeah. Like, is he still alive? You know, because at yeah. that point he was pretty much alive. But they were barely. like torturing him basically because yeah, they, they wanted him, him to keep him alive to get Basil there. But yeah, so he's basically like throughout the movie they keep cutting back to Damien's castle and he's got him strung up or on a table and they're they've beaten the shit out of him. They just imply he's just been had his ass kicked so and hard. He's the whole time the cool part and he's is just he's, being he's an, kind he, of waiting for yeah. for Basil because he knows that. Yeah. He's and he's come. also like fucking kill me. Like yeah. I don't give a shit. Like he's he's still like mouthing off to him. Like yep. Fats is shit. honestly the best character in the movie. Yeah. Like hands and, down. Um, so he's asking, you know, is Fat alive? Blah blah. So you take him to Fat and they they kind of kind of give them their own moment, you know. Yeah. And he talks to him and he's like, you know, I thought you were gonna, you forgot about me. And he's like, yeah. of course not. You have the money. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um. And then you and know then at he, that point they they kind of they kind of share a moment and Fat passes away. Um, yeah, but the this is this is what really bugged me. And I I did look online and I seen there was somebody else who did a review. Oh really? And they mentioned this, and I for sure have the same complaint. Is in the end he just vanishes off into the fog, into the mist. Yeah, whatever, with it's kind horse. of left ambiguous. But it's like the whole thing of the crow is he was put back for one reason to get revenge. Yeah. So why this almost feels like is this just another? Like a kill count, yeah. Because if he's still going like, in, is he he's gonna still wander alive. the world forever? You know, it's like he was only stuck in this world because he had to avenge the death to make things right. But it's like it almost feels yeah. like it makes this whole situation just like another killing adventure, just another day for him. Instead of like, this is why he came back. Yes, you know, and that's my. Which I mean, problem. it's weird that he came back and he's around on Earth for twenty seven years before he even goes after. The, like you said, it's weird that he loses his memory. And has no memory of it. And it's kind of the same thing. Like, oh, what happens to him afterwards? I will point out, though. I don't know if you remember. And this is only kind of explained in some deleted scenes. But in The Crow 2, City of Angels, Mm -hmm. he basically he finishes the job. And he's supposed to go back. But Sarah gets kidnapped. So he decides not to go back. And then the movie. And then he goes and uh, tries to save Sarah or whatever. But she dies and whatever. And then the movie ends with him just driving off on a motorcycle. And it's, again, left ambiguous. I guess there was a deleted scene in that movie that basically explained that since he gave up his chance to go back to heaven, he can never go back to heaven. And he's just cursed to live on Earth forever. Something as small as that little detail could do so much. You know what I mean? And I I personally, I, I will not defend it. I like Crow City of Angels just because, like, I like the main character. I like the whole magician aspect of him, and I. It's a really dark and fucking weird movie compared Dude, to the just first like, one. I mean, just like me, I I love the Crow, and I was really harsh on him. The Wicked Prayer, I would never watch. No, movie. no, the but, three and four. I mean, uh, even three. I, I I liked Salvation. I will say, yeah, I, th- I thought Eric Mabius, whatever. I thought it was fun, and I liked. There was the some good stuff starring. to it. Stuff, yeah, you know? yeah. I, the, I thought it was fun. it was a fun movie to watch. Like it's yeah. I would never the, recommend it. Yeah, the crows. But, the crow movies aren't fucking Oscar yeah. winners. Two but, and three are like guilty pleasures. Yeah. Um. But all in all, I, I think if the script what had nothing to do with the crow, it would be definitely something for if not you know horror fans, at least um, Rob Zombie fans for sure. You know. Yeah. Um. But again, if they if they were to ever take things from this, I hope it wouldn't be the whole monsters everywhere thing because i felt like it just it was almost too much you know it's um it's almost like if you try to make dinner you know and your your main course or your main dish is the steak you know like yeah but on top of steak you make chicken legs you make fucking a whole bunch of things it's like oh well, you're taking away from what your whole main part of the yeah. meal is and the whole if the whole thing is about Basil and he's the main character and he is the crow. Yeah. Like and I guess he has a little fucking poem in the end where he is the crow. Yeah. Like give give him a little bit more. Like we need a little more to sink our teeth. As, into for as, as for being him being the main character, you spend very little time with him and he does the least amount in the movie almost. Like like I said, I think Fats is the main character. I think Fats is the best character. It's almost like if you were to make the crow from the point of view of Sarah. Right, right. Like, but and, and that's the thing. You're, you're when when you've watched a crow, 
hundreds of times. You, you're so used to seeing it from his perspective, which is why you kind of grow this um, this connection with Brandon Lee's character, with Eric yeah. Draven, because you're just like, from one, you see all the flashbacks from his from his mind. Yeah. You see what he went through. You even get and to see the... you the, follow the, him through the whole yeah, movie. Even, like, even even the intimate moments with his wife, all the cute moments with his, with his you know, fiance, yeah. you could say. Um, and those all just built connection with the character, because in the yeah. end, you felt more sympathy in the end. You know, like... And it's, the, Th- this is a problem. There's Fats is somebody who came to know him later, and that's kind of your only connection you have with him in the movie. And they spend a good part of the movie separated from each other. And then the only other character is his mom, who's killed in the first five minutes, and you don't get any reference to her ever again until the last five minutes. And they mention he has a dad who gets no screen time at all. Like, we have no character. For him to be avenging, for him to even care about, for to even care about him, except I, for Fats. I think the 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 biggest mistake would have was making him a boy and dying. I think if yeah, you would have made him, that's uh, weird. Like, let's say you know your dad passed away. Like, what if the story was something more along the lines of, okay, well, I'm a young man, and I my, thought it was going to be the dad. Somebody killed my dad, and I didn't want my mom to live alone, so I was living alone with my mom. Yeah. So, you know, and then, then Damien comes and he kills my mom and he kills me. So then at least even if it's a young man, he doesn't have to spend fucking 27 years doing God knows yeah, what. Like, like you tell me throughout when those I was 27 reading... years, I think it's like throughout those 27 years, he didn't get one flashback. Yeah. Like, like you know, like, like that, that's, that's what like bugged me. I, I got the fact that. Like you're telling me he was never near death before. Yeah. Like, and then especially being a bounty hunter for, and just. And just being a child. <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm just thinking like throughout those 27 years, if what you were doing was going around riding horses, killing people for money for. You know, finding everybody who's yeah. wanted and killing him. You never like, took a bullet, yeah, like, in the arm or something? Yeah, there was one moment where you got a little flashback and thought, what the fuck am I? Yeah. And that's just where... Or, like, this crow that... I don't even know. Do they mention the crow following him before the flashback? Or does the crow not even come into it until afterwards? You know, I feel like the I don't even... I feel like they don't even mention it until he has his flashback. And then all of a sudden, oh, I have this bird now, too. Yeah, and I just... I, I didn't... I, the fact that they were on horses too. They're just like horses, crows. I mean, I like the idea of it being like a western. Like I'm cool with that. Yeah, it, but it felt if to it's... me like Borderlands, but yeah, like but a like little more westerny. A western, but what the fuck western with the stone golem. Like you know. I'm... Yeah. Th- see, it's that stuff. It that has to be a special kind down. of movie to have those two things in one. You know, like you have to really. Explain... <laughs> no movie could have pulled that off. <laughs> like, like if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if it's gonna be that wild, and there's zombies, there's witches, there's ghouls, there's horses, there's fuck. You know, like you're doing all this in one world. You got to give some kind of fucking foundation or some kind of some explanation as to yeah. why this world is the way it is. And if that's the case, at the very least, show some kind of separation as to how powerful the crow is yeah. compared to all these guys. Because honestly, you can look at the giant ape guy and assume and his character is way stronger than, you know. Yeah, Basil never really comes into contact with any other main character, like villain. Like, he never fights Skag. He never. There's no other big villain like the only other named villain is Gretchen the witch and he never comes in contact with her either it's just like him doing his bounty hunter thing and taking out a lot of foot soldiers but uh other than that the only main villain he fights is Damien yeah it's um again I mean if you're a Rob Zombie fan I definitely suggest checking it out only because the the visuals and stuff are fun yeah he like I said he just he's very good at writing a world and creating and I would love to see what he would do with something similar to this or given another draft of this if he took out all the crow stuff what he could turn it into I'd totally be down to look at that yeah no for sure uh yeah I mean I don't know I I really want to know more about this there's not enough information out there I like, if I could fucking set it up, I would love to fucking meet him and just ask him about it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I, okay, so from, we'll start doing from now, like, at the end of the ones we do, just do a five star rating. I think this one, for sure, I would give it a 2.5. Only because if I like it, if I like it enough to where I think it would be fun as a standalone film, I can't say I hated it. But at the same time, if I'm judging it from a crow movie, yeah. I would say it's probably 1.5. But, you know, all in all, I think. The way, I mean, even the, as a his crow movie, it's better solid. than some of the sequels. Like, I don't think it'd be a good crow movie. I as think it'd be a Tito much Ortiz better standalone and, movie. And, and Angel and fucking 
Tara Reid with her crooked tits. Oh my like, god! If, if, if those people aren't in the movie, then Ugh, I'd, I'd still I hate watch Tara Reid so much. She's or, just one of those actresses. I mean, she's terrible. That's why I don't like her. But Edward she's Furlong. one of those actresses. Yeah. You should have never been the crow. I don't no. know who who's watching. Terminator I hope Super. nobody even knows what we're talking about. Like they haven't seen the fourth crow. No, movie I hope I hope so that bad. you hear all these weird names and you're just like, wait, is this all in one movie? Because if yeah. you don't know, yes, and it's Crow Four: Wicked Prayer, Ugh. and it's by far the worst. I never worst even thing. finished it. I'm pretty sure that somebody whose favorite movie is Terminator 2 and just wanted to meet Edward Furlong. Yeah. That's, I'm convinced because there's no so reason bad. why anybody who sees the, the Crow movies thinks uh, Edward Furlong when you think, like, you know, no, badass. It was so terrible. <laughs> this would have been a better movie than that. Like, yeah, yeah. No, this would have sure. been better than Salvation, I would say, because it would have been fucking ballsy. Like, it's so different. Like, you can never look at the first Crow movie and uh, envision a sequel like this. No. So, like, just on that alone, it probably get a few like, for me. Based on the books, there were a whole bunch of different crows. There were yes, there. Were, I mean, there's one main. I'm a little fuzzy on all this. I know there's one main crow comic who's it's written by like, Jason James, o, o, James, James O'Barr. Yeah, yeah. So he wrote the one book, and then I know there's other comics and there's novels and stuff. But I I don't know if any of them are like official or mm. if he's involved in any of them at all. But there are a lot of it because I know there's like a Native American one and stuff like that. I don't know how official those are, but there's there's a lot of different ones that are different interpretations. They're all standalone. None of them are sequels or anything. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they're all very different, but nothing like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know what? I'm glad I read it because it was yeah. uh, it was fun. It took me on. A this day. was one of the ones that when I was collecting scripts for the podcast and I saw, I was like, I can't wait to read this because I have to know what it is. Yeah. No, like, I just from the title alone. It, like a long time ago. See, I never even heard about it. It was just I, one that popped up on my radar when I was collecting scripts for the podcast. It was back when I heard about House of Thousand Corpses and him fighting to get it done. And then I also read that he had. Yeah, because there was the a crow. That, that was something I learned recently because he's good friends with Chris Hardwick and he did the Nerdist podcast. I didn't know about the whole House of a Thousand Corpses thing being done for years before. Yeah, they got before it out. in that whole situation. So yeah, I would really like to know because there's no date on the script. I'd love to know where it is in correlation of his career. Like it, it, it's very early on. And I would love to know what his influences were for. for oh yeah, absolutely. This is a uh, definitely interesting. You know, um, I don't know if it'll ever be a future episode, but if there's ever a way or if it even exists but the show the show rob zami th- was uh starting to write a movie called tyrannosaurus rex which this i remember hearing about a long time ago yeah and he released um like a didn't you do like an art. animated thing too? it was just a, it was just like a poster it was like kind of yeah. like a movie poster and um it kind of had this weird like 80s horror like or like, kind of like a, I don't even know. It, it, it kind of gave off like a House of a Thousand, like Devil's Rejects kind of feel. Yeah. But in the background, you see like a, in the clouds, a silhouette of like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, which, I mean, it kind of had like a Rob Zombie vibe, but at the same time, it was kind of like this, where you're just like, this, yeah. it's, it seems like a total mindfuck. Yeah, you know, well, you how, showed me this right before we recorded. Yeah. Because um, I remember hearing about it, but I it was just totally off my radar at this point. Yeah, and he did that one, and um, as well as The Blob. I know he was going to do a remake of that. And I yeah, I did, hear, I did ever... hear about that, actually. I don't think that ever even got very far. Yeah, so... um, I'll, I'll definitely see if I can find the Tyrannosaurus Rex thing. Yeah, like, I haven't any... heard about it ever coming out, but I'll, I'll do a search to see if I can find something. Yeah, or if you guys are listening, if there's anybody who's interested yeah, in those... Yeah, absolutely. If anybody be... wants to send us, uh, you can email us at shelledfilmpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, if... or better yet, here, I'll even I'll even take a little bit a little bit further. If, if somebody finds the script and they contact Jeremy with the script... I will send you a free Cryptic Closet shirt of your choice. So, yes, which is Cryptic Closet is your horror-themed clothing line. Correct, yeah. So you can check it out. It's uh, thecrypticcloset.com. Um, we have everything from like Lone Dark, Eddie Monster pins to... Yeah, you know, and you can follow them on Instagram as well, at the Cryptic Closet. Yeah. And there's a lot of cool stuff. You've given me some shirts and you've shown me some of your pins. The, the Eddie Monster pin that you showed me the other day, that's awesome. Yeah, I um I even have a crow shirt there. But it's, oh, yeah. it's a Hangman's Joke, which was Eric oh, Draven's okay. band. Yeah. They're like a fake tour shirt. Yeah, I wouldn't have even see that's so deep cut crow thing. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. have even picked that up. All right. I mean, is there anything else you need to promote then? I think we're pretty much done here, right? No, but um I look forward to doing the next one. Um yeah. I know we had a couple lined up. We were talking about Yeah. Like um like a Alien, right? There was like a Yeah, there's the original Prometheus scripts, Alien Engineers. Which yeah. yeah, that one that'll be in May when the movie's coming. Yeah. But um yeah, if you guys have any 
questions or again if you guys uh know anything about those movies we're talking about feel free to reach out and yeah uh, absolutely again i'll say my email again it's shelled film podcast at gmail.com and you can email us anything and we check all the emails and read them on the mini episodes if anybody wants to send you can also follow the show on twitter at at shelved podcast everything is so wordy <laughs> um and always be sure to check the tumblr to see what scripts are coming up and check out the episodes at shelvedfilmpodcast.tumblr.com. I'm trying to get everything short. But uh, thank you, man. Thanks for sitting with me, talking about thank Rob Zombie's me, Crow. Man. Anytime. Anytime you have anything to do with the Crow or Rob Zombie <laughs> yeah, or horror, any, any kids dying, I will be here. <laughs> well, that seems to be a running theme so far. So. so I'll see you next week. Yeah, all right. <laughs>